Hi there, Mr. Holcomb here with another episode of The Math Behind the Modules. Okay, lesson 14, graphing factored polynomials. Okay, now we're going to graph them. So we're going to see why we factor and why we get what are called zeros. All right, opening exercise says an engineer is designing a roller coaster for younger children and has tried some functions to model the height of the roller coaster during the first 300 yards. She came up with the following function to describe what she believes would make a fun start to the ride. So she has this function h of x equals negative 3x to the fourth power plus 21x cubed minus 48x squared plus 36. All right, where h of x is the height of the roller coaster in yards when the roller coaster is 100 X yards from the beginning of the ride. Answer the following questions to help determine at which distances from the beginning of the ride of the roller coaster is at the lowest height. Okay. So we're trying to determine at which distances from the beginning of the ride, the roller coaster is at its lowest height. All right, so we're looking for what's called a minimum. A, does the function describe a roller coaster that would be fun to ride? Explain. Hmm. Okay. Let's take a look at this. Should I graph it? Now let's wait. Okay, so let's just review what these, these values in the function mean. So this negative three X to the fourth, well, a fourth degree polynomial is going to look like this. So one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four. And this negative in front tells us that it's going to be this one, okay? It will not go up on the ends, it will go down. So it's looking like this, so there's the start of figuring out what this thing is going to look like. And a slope of negative three, negative three X to the fourth. So if I put a one in here, I would get negative three plus 21, which is seven, it's 18, 18, and put a one in here, 18 minus 48 is negative 30 plus 36 would give me a six, a value of six. So at the time one, at the height H of X, where uh, X is one, I'd be at 18. Is that right? Negative three plus 21 is 18. Negative 30 plus six, six. Okay, we'd be at the height of six. If I put a two in, and that's what we do. We just try to figure out where this is going. Okay. So does this function describe a roller coaster that would be fun to ride? Well, there's a lot. There's a couple of ups and downs. So you might just say this is just um, an opinion question. So you could say, yes, it does, or no, it doesn't. It looks like it would be too steep and that kind of thing. So let's continue to be. Can you see any obvious X values from the equation where the roller coaster is at height zero? Okay, well, there is no constant at the end here. So if I had a plus three at the end and made all these X's zero, my answer, my H of X would equal the constant. So when you don't have a constant function or constant value at the end, and I plug in zero for all these X's, well, I'd get zero plus zero minus zero plus zero, which is zero. So the obvious X values for this equation where the roller coaster is at height zero is when X equals zero. All right, part C says, use a graphing utility, graph the function H on the intervals from zero to three and identify when the roller coaster is zero yards off the ground. So we're going to use the graphing calculator. So if you're familiar with the TI calculator, the first thing I'm going to do is adjust my window because it says X goes from zero to three. So I'm gonna to go to window and I want my X minimum to be zero and my X maximum to be three. That's the first thing I'm going to change. 
Actually, let me zoom six this first and then go to my window so it's negative 10 to 10 and negative 10 to 10. And I have a function in there from prior, so let's get rid of that. Go to y equals and clear and clear. Okay, so now let's go back to window. So now I'm negative 10 to 10, negative 10 to 10, and I want my x to go from zero to three. So my x minimum is zero and my x maximum is three. Then I go to y equals and I put this function in there. So it'd be negative three x to the fourth. Get out of the exponent plus 21 x cubed minus 48 x squared, forgot my x. Forty eight X squared plus thirty six X. OK, and then I'm going to graph it from zero to three. OK, and there it is. All right, so there's our roller coaster. So it doesn't go below the um, X axis. So I could adjust my window now and zoom in a little closer on this and make my Y minimum negative one, just so we can still see our axis. And I hit graph now, and now that's, I got a nice fit to it on the table or on the graph. And there is our roller coaster. Okay, identify when the roller coaster is zero yards off the ground. So it's zero yards off the ground when, y, when x equals zero, when x equals and it looks like it's on the ground right here because this is the ground. So it looks like it's on the ground at X equals two. And it looks like it comes back down to the ground at X equals three because that's our window. So I would say X equals zero, X equals two and X equals three. All right, part D says, what do the X values you found in part C these X values of zero, two, and three, what do they mean in terms of the distance from the beginning of the ride? So here's the beginning of the ride right here. We go up, up, up to a maximum, we turn and down we come, and then here we are back at zero, and then up a little bit more and then back down to ground level. Well, it says right here, when the roller coaster is 100 times X yards from the beginning of the ride. So 100 times zero is zero. 100 times 2 is 200, and 100 when x is 3 would be 300. So the x values mean in terms of the distance of the beginning of the ride is 100 times those x values. So that means 0 yards from the beginning of the ride when you're at the beginning of the yard, 200 yards when you're at x equals 2, and 300 yards from the beginning of the ride when x equals three. So this is 100 yards, this is 200 yards, and this is 300 yards. E says, why do roller coasters always start with the largest hill first? Okay, well, the largest hill first is because they use a, um, an electric motor to pull the roller coaster up until it gets to this point right here and then gravity takes over. And so it builds momentum and that gets the roller coaster going and that is why. Okay, so you could say, so they can build up speed from gravity to help propel the cars through the rest of the track. Okay, page two, part F says to verify your answers to part C, so I brought them over. We got X equals zero, X equals two, and X equals three. Hello by factoring the polynomial function h. So h of x equals negative 3x to the fourth plus 21x cubed minus 48x squared plus 36. So to factor this, I can say, well, three will go into 21, three will go into 48, three will go into 36. So I'm going to factor out a negative three. So you'd write h of x equals and factor out the negative three. And this is x to the fourth, x cubed, x squared, x, and there's no constant. So all four terms have at least one x in them, so I can factor out one x. And then I divide. Negative three divided by negative three is one. x to the fourth divided by x 
is x cubed. Positive divided by a negative is negative. 21 divided by 3 is 7. x cubed divided by x is x squared. Negative divided by a negative is positive. 48 divided by 3 is 16. x squared divided by x is x. Positive divided by a negative is negative. 36 divided by 3 is 12. x divided by x is 1. It's 1 times 12 or just 12. <clears throat> okay. So we have h of x equals negative 3x. And by the way, this negative 3x, if we took negative 3x and set it equal to 0, because that's what you do with factors, and you solve for x by dividing both sides by negative 3, you get x equals 0, which is this one. So we verified one right there. And now we need to find the others. Okay, it's a fourth degree polynomial, so there should be four solutions or four zeros, same thing. Okay, so now we need to factor this. So the first thing I wanna look at is see if I can group it. So if I do this, what would I factor out? An x squared, and that would leave x minus seven. Well, seven does not go into 12, so that's not going to work. So you always check that first. So we can't factor that by grouping. So another thing we can do is look at the graph. And notice that it's 0 at x equals 3. So if x equals 3 is a solution and we want it set equal to 0, we subtract 3 from both sides and you get x minus 3 equals 0. Okay, and we're using this solution. So we're using the solution in the graph right there. So I'm going to factor out an x minus 3 and see what that will give me. So I'll do that over here. So if I take x minus 3 and divide it the x cubed minus 7x squared plus 16x minus 12, and I factor that then I say x cubed divided by x is x squared. And then I multiply and get x cubed. And then negative 3 times x squared is negative 3x squared. Subtract that. That cancels. Negative 7 minus a negative 3 is plus. So be careful. Negative 4x squared. Bring down my plus 16. Negative 4 divided by 1 is negative 4 x squared divided by x is x. So we're going to multiply this through by negative 4x. That would give me negative 4x squared. Negative times a negative is positive. I forgot my x here. And 4x times 3 is 12x. We're going to subtract that. This cancels. 16 minus 12 is 4x and bring down my minus 12. 4x divided by x is 4. 4 times x is 4x. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. That should be an x. And when I subtract these, that's a 12. Holy cow. Let's fix that. Try again. 4 times x, 4x. Four, 4 times a negative 3, negative 12. Subtract, get 0. So x minus 3 is a factor which proves which check, which solidifies the fact that this is a solution. I verified that. So the next one should be x equals 2. So now I have x squared minus 4x plus 4. So now I'm going to say x squared minus 4x plus 4 would go here. So I'm breaking this down to all its factors. So I get negative 3x as 1, which gives me the 0 the x minus 3, which gives me the 3. And this should factor out as well. And let me just put a barrier here. Keep that out of the way. And I am going to get an x here and an x here. Factors of 4 that add up to 4 are 2. And they both need to be negative because the middle term is negative and the last term is positive. So x minus 2 times x minus 2 are the other two factors. So that verifies this. So it has a multiplicity of two that is called a double root. 
And let me explain what that does on a graph. So notice x minus two is there twice. Well, when you have a double root, it means it comes down, touches and goes back up. It doesn't break across that line. So if I change my window now to x max of four and continued beyond where we are, the graph is gonna come down and touch and it went below here. So that's a sig, and then it's gonna go, it's gonna decrease forever. And it's gonna decrease forever over here. So this went through, so that's only one time it crossed. And this goes all the way through and continues. So if I change my window to x min as negative one and graph it, now I'm gonna to go to the left a little more. You can see it went down. So if I change my window also for my y's, my y minimum to say negative five, then we're going to clearly see that it crossed here, came down, touched and went back up and crossed. So when it crosses, it's a, it's a root. When it crosses, it's a root that was here. But at two, it didn't cross. It came down, it touched, and it bounced off and went back up. That's a double root, okay? So that's what it does in a graph when you have two factors that are equal. Now G says, how do you think the engineer came up with the function for this model? Okay, so it's, here's what you would say. To start at height of zero yards and end at 300 yards later at a height of zero yards, she multiplied x by x minus three to create zeros at zero and three. To create the bottom of the hill at 200 yards, she multiplied this function by x minus two squared. She needs to multiply by negative three to guarantee the roller coaster's shape and to adjust the overall height of the roller coaster. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. And part H, what is wrong with the roller coaster model at distance zero yards and 300 yards? Why might this not initially bother the engineer when she first designed the track? Well, what is wrong with it is, okay, so we're not going beyond, so we're going underground is what that means. If we cross the zero and keep going, we are going below the ground level or the starting point. Um, and it never comes back up. So something's, it, maybe it rotated around at a certain level and, re, and touched. So what would we say here? Okay, so in this one, since we're only going from zero to 300 yards, the model appears to abruptly start at zero yards and abruptly end at 300. In fact, the roller coaster looks as if it will crash into the ground at 300 yards. The engineer may be planning to smooth out the track later at zero yards and 300 yards after she has selected the overall shape of the coaster. Okay, so that's what I was saying. It looks like it's going underground or actually if you can't go underground, you'd be hitting the ground. And if you're going at any momentum, then obviously people would get injured. Okay, page two, example one says to graph each of the following polynomial functions. What are the function zeros counting their multiplicities and what are the solutions to f of x equals zero? What are the x-intercepts to the graph of the function? How does the degree of the polynomial function compare to the x-intercepts of the graph of the function? Okay, so we're given this function in factored form. So what we do is take each factor and set it equal to zero. That's our starting point. So x equals zero, well, there is one of the solutions. So at x equals zero, we are crossing the x-axis. So I've already put the axes in labeling them X and Y. And then I take X minus one equals zero, set it equal to zero and solve for X by adding one to both sides. So we would get X equals one. Um, so I'm gonna go over one, two, three, four, five and call this one. And I'm going to put a point right there, okay? And then I'm gonna take X plus one and set it equal to zero and solve for x by subtracting one over to the other side and we get x equals negative one. So if I go over one, two, three, four, five, this is negative one here and I'm going to put a dot there, okay? So if I were to multiply these all out, it would be a cubic, it'd be x cubed. So a, a function that has a degree of three and notice we have three zeros. So the multiplicities of each one of these uh, factors is one. Okay, there are no multiplicities greater than one. So we have three solutions, negative one, zero, and one. 
an x cubed function, if I multiply this out, okay, I will, I will do it. So if I have f of x equals x times x minus one times x plus one, the first thing I want to do is multiply these. So x times x is x squared. x times one is one, one x minus one x cancels. One times a negative one will give me negative one. So it's x squared minus one. This is a difference of squares. And then that would simplify to x times x squared equals x cubed and x times negative one is negative x. So this is the function x cubed minus x, okay? So the degree of the polynomial tells us how many solutions we're going to get, okay? So it says, how does the degree of the polynomial function compare to the x-intercepts of the graph? So we have three x-intercepts, we have a degree of three. What do uh, degree threes look like? Well, we have something that increases, then decreases, and then increases again. Okay, or it could decrease, then increase, and then decrease again. So there are two turning points and increase, decrease, increase, or decrease, increase, decrease. When X is positive, it's increasing this way. When, or not X, when the leading coefficient is positive. When A, the leading coefficient is negative, it would be decreasing. So this is not negative. So my function would look like that. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about <clears throat> terminology here. What are the functions zeros? Well, the zeros are when you set the factors equal to zero. So the zeros are zero, one, and negative one. What are the solutions to f of x equals zero? Well, the solutions are what makes this zero? So What makes f of x zero? In other words, zero equals. So then you would say f of zero, f of x equals zero. So then you would say, what am I doing? Then you would say zero equals this function here, x cubed minus x. And if I plug a zero in, zero cubed is zero minus zero is zero. So that makes it a zero. Plugging one in, one cubed is one, one minus one is zero and plug in negative one, negative one cubed is negative one, minus a negative one is plus one, negative one plus one is zero. So what are the solutions to f of x equals zero? Well, the solutions are also x equals zero, x equals one, and x equals negative one. What are the x-intercepts to the graph of the function? Well, the x-intercepts are negative one, zero, and one. So notice what's going on here x-intercepts to the graph are x equals 0, x equals 1, and x equals negative 1. So what I'm trying to point out to you is the zeros, the solutions, and the x-intercepts are the same values because these are three terms that mean the same thing. So then when I go to graph this, I'm not going to get into detail as to see how large it gets in between negative 1 and 0. Um, but I could plug in a half just to get halfway. Um, and so if I put 0.5 in here, so here's what I would do just to find the maximum right here. It should occur at the midpoint because it should go up to the midpoint and then come back down. So if I said F of 0.5 would equal 0.5 to the third power minus 0.5. And rather than decimals, I'm going to switch that to a half because it's easier to deal with fractions than it is decimals. Okay, so I'm going to put f of one half and make it negative here. I'm going to do the left side first. And so it's going to be f of negative one half equals negative one half cubed. Well, negative one cubed is negative one and two cubed is eight. So negative one eighth minus a negative, which is plus one half, which is four eighths. So that's going to equal three eighths. Okay. So if I made this one, two, three, four, and made this one, then two, four, six, eight, three eighths would be about here. Okay, so this is going to come up 
like so and come back down. And we're gonna get the same answer over here with a positive. It's just gonna become negative three eighths. So I will go up one down one and a half and put a point here. And this is going to curve, come down and turn and go back up. And then we're not going to, it's gonna go forever and ever. So we're just gonna do this. So there is the graph of this function. Okay, part B. So I put the coordinates in, the x-axis, the y-axis, I should say. And this function is x plus 3 times itself four times. Okay, so that'd be the equivalent of saying f of x equals x plus 3 to the power of 4. So our solution to this is going to, when you take any one of those factors which are all the same and set it equal to zero and subtract three from both sides to get the x isolated, we get a solution where x equals negative three. So the solution is negative three, the root is negative three, the zero is x equals negative three. So if I go over one, two, three and put a dot here, then I'm going to get zero when I plug in negative three to this. So what's going to happen if I made this zero, well, zero plus three, if x equals zero, so we'd be at the origin, what would our y value be? Well, zero plus three is three, plus three, or, and this would be three, and this would be three, and this would be three, or it'd be three times three, which is nine times three is 27 times three is 81. We would be way up the y-intercept would be 81, which is three to the fourth power. So it's going to go up. So what this is going to look like, it's hard to draw with this. Um, it's going to look like this. And then it's going to go up and it's going to cross at y equals 81. And then it's going to be uniform over here. So it's going to look like that. So here's what it looks like in the graph. And the reason I'm showing you this is it looks like it's touching and there's a whole bunch of zeros along here. But if I use the trace feature, so if I hit graph, and I've um, adjusted my window to be x is negative 10 to zero, because I'd have to go all the way up to y equaling 81 to see where it crosses the x axis. So it's never gonna get to the, I'm sorry, the y axis. It's never going to get to the y axis in a window that only goes up to 10 since the y intercept would be way up at 81. So I made my window negative 10 to zero. And that zoomed in on it nicely. So this is our x-axis. So we're just looking over here. And if you hit the trace button, it gives you a cursor and it tells you the x value there and the y value. So we're at a height of 4.6. Now, as I go this way, notice that dropped to 3.4. Again, it drops 2.4 and then down to 1.7, 1.1, and so on. We're getting smaller and smaller, but notice it looks like we're on the line right here, but it's still. 0.14 above zero. It's still not zero. And as I get closer to negative three, it is still not zero. It looks like it's touching, but the graph just isn't, um, we're not zoomed in enough, if you will, to be able to see that it is not crossing yet. But if you look at the y value, you see that it is not zero. 0 0.007 is greater than zero. 0 0.001 is greater than zero. Now we are moving the decimal five places. So it'll be 0 0.000052. That's still not zero. And then we're going to start going up again. Okay. But if I hit second calculate and I calculate my zero and I tell it, and then it says left bound, then what you do is you move your cursor to the left of where you think it is zero. So there we're not on the x axis. So I hit enter. Now it says right down. So we want to find where it is going to be a zero in between these two arrows, if you will. Okay, there's my right down. So we're, our guess is what that means is what is zero in between these two arrows? And if I hit enter, I get the point. Give it a minute. Error, no sign change. Okay. So it can't find a double root using this because it's looking to see where the function goes from positive to negative or negative to positive. So we can't use our calculator to find the zero of a double root. Okay, so here is the graph of that. 
So the zeros are negative three, negative three, negative three, negative three. And I forgot to open this again. Sorry about that. Not that it matters. Um, so this, it repeated four times. So the so the um, the zero, the root, or the solution is negative three with a multiplicity of four. The x-intercept is negative three. The zeros are three. The solutions are negative three. Okay. The degree is four, which is greater than the number of x-intercepts. Okay. It only crossed once even though it's degree four, but it was a root that repeated four times. Okay, so page four brings us to another one. And what I usually look at first is how many parentheses are there? How many factors do they have here? And there's one, two, three, four, five. So I know that this is a polynomial of degree six. And if I multiply the constants at the end, that would give me my, so there's going to be um, stuff in between and then a constant at the end. So we could say f of x equals six x or x to the six plus a bunch of stuff in between. And then at negative one times negative two is positive two times three is six times four is 24. 24 times four is 96. So I know my y intercept is 96. So if this was 100 all the way up here, then I know that this is going to cross. And what's that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let me move it up one more. So every square is 10. So there's 100 right there. So 96 would be right about there. Okay. All right. Now, x minus 1 equals zero. If I took x minus one equals to zero, then I add one to both sides, then I get x equals one. So if this were in increments of one, then I put x equals one. This would be x equals two. So it's just the opposite of the sign in there. x equals negative one, two, three would be right here. x equals negative four. Okay. It's a fifth degree polynomial, or six, I mean, no, five. I made a mistake right here, it is five. It's of degree five. And of degree five would be up two, three, four, five, if A is positive and all these X's are positive. So it would look like this some, somewhat. Now there is an X plus four twice. That means that it has a multiplicity of two, which means it's a double root. So at negative four, so this is coming up from below and the first uh, solution is here. So it's gonna come up and touch but not cross and go back down. So it's going to go up, touch there, turn, go down, turn, go up. And it's going to, that's not a very good drawing there. So it's gonna come like this and then down and then up. And it's gonna keep rising until we get up to 96 and then it's going to turn and it is going to continue down like so, and then finally go up like that. Okay, so that is what the graph would look like. I don't know the height, the minimum, the, these, these are called local or relative minimum, relative minimum, and I, that's the only two values I don't know. I'm not sure where this would be. There is a way to find it, um, but I'm not going to do that in this lesson. I just wanted to do a sketch of this. So when I turn my calculator on and go to y equals and graph this, then it's just x minus 1 times x minus 2 times x plus 3 times x plus 4. And I can just put a squared there for those two x plus 4s and hit graph. So my window is definitely not in the right place, but there's my double root right here. And here's where it crossed at negative three and went up. Now remember I said the y-intercept is 96. So if I set my window y maximum of 100, okay, and my x maximum, instead of just going to zero, let's go out to 10, then we should be able to see this better. So there it is. Okay, so what happened was this isn't a maximum. So now I know that if I just erase this portion right here, 
I'm going to fix that. I do know the y-intercept is 96, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the maximum. So what happened was this thing, this, this graph actually went like so. Okay, it went up higher than the y-intercept. Then it turned and crossed at that 96. I'm struggling with this pen. So it went up above, crossed like so, and came down like that. So my, my height is still not there, but it did cross at 96. So if I change my window some more to Y max, say 150, I'll see if I found my, the highest point it goes, and it did, okay. And I can't find my lowest point here, so now I gotta change my window. Y min of negative 10 wasn't enough. Let's try negative 30 just to see. I don't know the value, I haven't tried to calculate it. And there it did show, okay? So that's kind of what I have here. So it goes up, hits the X axis and bounces off of it. That's what double roots do. And then it came back up and it broke through and then became positive and then it turned and the Y intercept right here is this 96, okay? And then it continues down and that's one turns and it's got a minimum here, it comes back up to two. So that's what we kind of have here, okay? Next problem. Okay, so now this one is a little bit different. Our first term is, our first factor is x squared plus one. So what's going to happen there? Well, if we have x squared plus one equals zero, and I subtract one over the other side, I get x squared equals a negative one. And when I take the square root of x squared, I'm going to get x equals the square root of negative one, which is an imaginary unit, okay? Which means it is not, it's a complex number. It is going to turn and not hit the X axis, okay? So we're gonna leave this one alone for a second and we're gonna skip to this. X minus two would be a Y or an X intercept at X equals two and X minus three would be positive three. Okay, so then the X squared plus one is turning, so this is a power of two, x squared plus one, and this times x would be x to the third times x, so this would be a fourth degree polynomial. So I should get four roots or solutions. So there's one, there's two, and then I have two complex, okay? And that's what they're called. So something funky happens at those locations. So we only have zeros here and here. That's not going to produce a zero. I showed you as imaginary. So my zeros would be x equals two and x equals three. So the zeros were x equals two and x equals three. The solutions were the same thing, two and three. And the x intercepts are that point, x equals two and x equals three. The degree is four, which is greater than the number of x intercepts because we had two that were imaginary or complex. So if I graph this thing, now let's take a look at it. So I do know it's fourth degree polynomial. So usually they look something like this, okay? Down, up, down, up when it's positive and an M if you will, when they're negative. But this value right here is just going to kind of make it do a weird turn. And then it's going to turn and do this sort of. That's what it's going to look like. So it's going to come down and turn and come up and then do something weird and go something like that, okay? Wherever this location is. So if I put that in my calculator now and hit clear and it's X squared plus one parentheses, X minus two, X minus, oops, not two, three, okay? And hit graph. Now I have to adjust my window, but not too much. So let me just zoom six for starters and then we'll see what we have to do. Okay, that looks actually pretty good. It's very similar to what I have here. And the y-intercept, by the way, would be one times negative two, which is negative two times a negative three, which is six. So actually this should be one, two, three, four, five, six. So my graph is off a little bit. I should be crossing up here. So this should come up and turn and go like this instead of this over here. Okay, 
So there it is. And the solutions roots, zeros are two and three. All right, example two. Now it says to consider the function f of x equals x cubed minus 3x squared plus 44x minus 32. And part A says to use the fact that x minus 4 is a factor of f to factor this polynomial. So that's where we're going to start. So we're going to factor. So when, you get, when you're given a factor, you can divide the polynomial to, to break it down to find other factors. So I'm going to take this x to the third minus 13x squared plus 44x minus 32. And I'm going to divide it by x minus 4. Okay, so x cubed divided by x is x squared. That will give me x cubed here. x squared times a negative 4 is negative 4x squared. This should be pretty routine by now. Subtract and be careful with your signs. Minus a negative is plus. This will give me nine, negative nine x squared. Bring down my plus 44 x. Negative nine divided by one is negative nine. x squared divided by x is x. Negative nine x times x, negative nine x squared. Negative nine times a negative four is a positive thirteen. Nine times four is 36, negative 36 x. Negative times a negative is positive, and we subtract. That goes away. 44 minus 36 is 8x. Bring down the minus 32, and I need an 8 times x to give me 8x, and 8 times a negative 4 is, I'm saying 4 in writing it, I wanted to say 32, negative 32, subtract, and we get no remainder. So now I have, all right, f of x equals, they gave us the first factor, so it's x minus 4. Now we have x squared minus 9x plus 8. Are there factors of 8 that add up to 9? Uh, yeah, 8 and 1. So x times x is x squared. I'll put eight here, I'll put one here. They both have to be the same sign, they both have to be negative. And negative eight times a negative one is positive eight, negative eight plus a negative one is negative nine. So we get x minus eight, x minus one. So notice that it's a, it's a third degree polynomial and we have three factors and therefore we have three solutions or roots or zeros or x-intercepts, which are zeros. Okay, so now B says, find the x-intercepts of the graph of f. Well, I'm just gonna speed this up a little because you should know now that all you do is take use the zero product property, set your function equal to zero, so f of x equals zero, and x would be four, so x would equal four. Here, x would equal eight. And here, x would equal 1 to make those 0. So the x-intercepts are these three numbers. C says, at which x values can the function change from being positive to negative or from negative to being positive? OK. Now, remember that a cubic looks like this if a is positive, which it is. Or it could do this and go down from left to right. Okay, this is if it's negative, this is if A is positive. And in our case, our A is positive. So our function would look something like this, depending on your maximum and your minimums here. Okay, and your y-intercept as to where it's located on the graph. So C says at which X values can, so if we think of it this way, and I draw a line through here, there's my X-intercept. And here is the points. Here are the three points where it crosses the x-axis, okay? That's where the function goes from negative to positive or positive to negative. So where does that happen? Well, it happens at x equals one, which is here, at x equals four, which is here, and at x equals eight, which is here. So I would say at x equals one, it went from negative to positive at 
x equals 4, it went from positive to negative. And at x equals 8, it went from negative to positive. OK, part D says, to sketch a graph of this function, we need to consider whether the function is positive or negative on the four intervals. And the four intervals are, so if these are our solutions, we want to know what happens that when, x, when um, x is less than 1, when x is between 1 and 4, when x is between 4 and 8, when, and when x is greater than 8. And that's what I'm showing here. Less than 1, between 1 and 4, between 4 and 8, and greater than 8. And that's what they have here. And it says, why is that? And the reason is the function can only change sign at the x-intercepts. Therefore, in each of those intervals, the graph will always be above or always be below the axis, OK? But be careful of multiplicities that are even because that's a double root order and the function comes down to the x-axis but turns and goes back up. And if that happens, there would not be a change from positive to negative. Keep that in mind. Now E says, how can we tell if the function is positive or negative on the intervals between the x-intercepts? OK, so we would evaluate the function at a single point in that interval. Since the function is either always positive or always negative between the x-intercepts, checking a single point will indicate behavior of the entire interval. So what they're saying is, if I had a value less than x is less than 1, plug 0 into the function and see what you get. If it's positive, you're above. If it's negative, you're below. And do that for all the intervals. Or you could actually do what I did here and do a quick rough sketch and look at the picture that you drew if you know that a quadratic or a cubic looks like this, positive or negative, a and all that, OK? Now, f says for x less than 1, is the graph above or below the x-axis? How can you tell? So if I look at this here, if I look at my graphs, and I'm going to bring this down and make it a little bit larger. OK, so. The two ways to do this is to do the rough sketch. And for x less than 1, that would be over here. It is this part right down here. So it's negative. But if you didn't graph it, and we go back to the function, the original, well, I'll, we'll plug in a value that's less than 1. So here's the function f of x equals x cubed minus 13x squared. So I would say f of, well, what function is what number is less than zero or less than one? Well, zero is a really easy number to calculate. So let's use f of zero. And that's going to equal zero cubed minus 13 times zero squared plus 44 times zero minus 32. And when I do that, my f of 0 is going to equal 0 minus 0 plus 0 is all 0 minus 32 is going to be negative 32. And so there is two ways of telling that. OK. For x being between 1 and 4, you just pick a value. So this time, I'm going to do f of 2. And that's going to equal 2 cubed minus 13 times 2 squared plus 44 times 2 minus 32. So f of 2 is going to equal 2 cubed is 8 minus 2 squared is 4. And that would be 4 times 13, which is 52, plus 44 times 2, which is 88, minus 32. So f of 2 is going to equal 8 minus 52 is a negative 44, plus 88 is 44, minus 32 is 12, if I did that correctly. It is positive, 
And the other way I could tell is if I did this quick sketch, I'm between one and four. I'm in this region right here and it is all above the X axis. Okay. Okay, H says four, the interval from four to eight. So any numbers between four and eight is the graph above or below the X axis. Well, between four and eight, if you look at the diagram I brought over, you'd be down here, it would be below, but let's just do it algebraically. And what was the function? X cubed minus 13 X squared plus 44 X minus 32. Okay, so I brought that over from the other page. It's right up here. So now we're going to choose a value between four and eight. So how about five? So it'd be F of five equals five to the third minus 13 times five squared plus 44 times five minus 32. So F of five is going to equal 125 minus 25 times 13. Okay, so I'm gonna show you something now. I am going to go in here at y equals, instead of having to do this over and over and over, watch what I'm going to do. I'm gonna put this function, okay, in the calculator. So I'm gonna put x to the third minus 13 x squared, oops, that's not squared, squared, no, 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 no. What are you doing, silly? Squared. What? Let's try that again. All right, try start over. X math three minus 13X squared plus 44X minus 32. And now I'm going to go to my table set right here. Second window gets us to table set and I wanna make sure it's set to ask. Then I go second table, which is graph. And um, usually it's blank. And I wanna check five, F of five. So I put five in here and I hit enter. And it comes out to be without spending all that time doing a calculation, it comes out to be negative. 12. Well, what did we say it was going to be? Well, right here, it's, we said it was going to be negative, and sure enough. And now it says for x greater than 8 is the graph above or below the x-axis. So what we would do if we were doing it algebraically, we would pick a value that's greater than 8. How about 10? And we would say 10 cubed minus 13 times 10 squared plus 44 times 10 minus 32 well, was that going to be positive or negative? Well, looking here, we know it's going to be over here somewhere and it's going to be positive. But if I do it with the calculator, now watch what I have to do, even though I, since I've already put y equals this, now I just put 10 in for x and hit enter. And wow, that was easy. So f of 10 is going to equal 108, which is definitely positive. Okay. Now, Jay says, use the information generated in parts F through I to sketch the graph of F. Okay, so now that I brought in, or I drew the X and Y axis. This is the X, obviously. This is the Y. Now I'm going to go back and see what F said. Here's F. For X being less than one, we're on the negative side, okay? So I'll use red for negative. So if this were one right here, we're on the negative side going this way, okay? And then if I go to G, oh, and before I even go there, let's go back to our three uh, solutions or zeros or X intercepts, four, eight, and one. Okay, so I want to plot those. I'm going to do that in green. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
So this is eight, this is four, this is one. And when I go back here, I need to fix what I just drew, by the way, in the red. For x less than one, I put negative one. So this line that I drew right here should actually be, oh, come on now, should actually be right there, okay? So it's negative when it's less than one. And then when I go to part G, between one and four, we have, we're positive. So between one and four, I'll put positive in green or blue, I'll do blue. Between one and four, the function is up like this and then turning and coming back down to our solution or our x-intercept of four. So we don't know the values here. It doesn't matter the numbers. We did get some numbers here. Okay, so that was F, that was G. So H says between four and eight, that's what that means. X is greater than four and less than eight. We are in this region here, from here to here, we got negative values, okay? Okay, so it's negative. So I'm gonna go back to red. And this is going to come down and at some point turn and come back up to our zero at eight. And then for X values greater than eight, we got a positive number of eight. So that means that this is going to look something like that. We don't know the maximum here. We don't know the minimum here. We don't know the Y intercept. Uh, yes, we do. The Y intercept would be negative 32. So this would be way down here. All right, so there it is. There's the sketch. Okay. Graph y equals f of x on the interval from 0 to 9 using the graphing utility and compare your sketch with the graph. So what they mean is they say to get the calculator and you turn it on and you go to y equals and it's x cubed minus 13x squared plus 44x minus and I think it was 36, no 32. So I've got that entered in my calculator. And then I want to change my window from zero to nine. So I want my X minimum to be zero and my X maximum to be nine. And I hit graph. Okay, so I'm not seeing the minimums and the maximum. So I got to change my window X and Y. So I know that my Y intercept is negative 32. So I want my Y minimum to be at least negative 32. So I'll say negative 35 and we'll just change one at a time and see what happened, okay? There we saw our max, our minimum here. Our maximum isn't quite showing here, so I wanna go up a little higher on the Y. So I want my Y max to be maybe 20, and that's how you mess around with this window. So here we go, finally, there it is, and there is the graph of our function, and it looks very similar to what I drew, except for this would be way down here at negative 32, okay? So there it is, negative until one, positive from one until four, negative from four to eight, positive after eight. And that is pretty similar. Okay, page seven brings us to this discussion. Can I have a discussion in video? Isn't a discussion two way? Anyhow, for any particular polynomial, can we determine how many relative maxima or minima there are? Consider the following polynomial functions in factored form and their graphs. So what you need to understand here is that these go forever and ever and ever. And wherever something switches from decreasing to increasing, okay, this function, as we go from left to right, think of reading a book and we're going on the X, Y axis. As you're going to the right, this function is decreasing until it gets to this value here, which looks like one and then it turns and starts to increase. So it went from decrease to increase. So this right here is a minimum. And when there's only one, it is the absolute minimum. It's as low as you can go. But then if I switch, let's skip over to H right now. This right here is a minimum. It went down, it turned, it went up. That is the minimum. It got to this point here. So this is a relative we call relative minimum. And why is that not an absolute minimum? Well, I'll get to that in a moment. There's another minimum here. So this is a maximum right here. 
This is a relative maximum. And then if it, it turns in, it goes down. So it's going from down to up here. So here is another relative minimum. Okay. And then you look at all of the minimums. This has two right here and right here. And the one that's the lowest, we no longer, it is still a relative minimum, but it is also the absolute. I forgot the S. It is also the absolute minimum. Okay, it's not that it's not a relative minimum. It is relative to this region of the graph, this X value, this is a minimum. This is a minimum, this is a maximum. This is an absolute minimum because it's as low as that function goes. It will never go lower than this anywhere. So this is going up forever and that's going up forever. This is not an absolute maximum because this point here is higher than that. There is no absolute maximum when they continue forever up. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. So here, this would be a relative max. And this here is a relative min. Okay. There are no absolute maxes or mins on this one because this goes down forever and this goes up forever. So it says for any particular polynomial, we can determine how many relative maxima or minima there are. Or can we consider the following polynomial functions in factored form? So this is in factored form, but how many factors does it have? It has two, two factors. One, min or max, okay? This has one, two, three factors, three factors, and it has a relative max and a relative min. So that is two maxes or mins. This is a degree one, two, three, four. This has four factors and it has one, two, three mins and maxes. So it's got two minimums and one maximum. So three mins and maxes. So as you can see, there's a pattern here. Whatever the degree, the number of minimums or maximums is one less than the degree. So the degree of each polynomial, I already did it. This was a degree of two. This is a degree of three. This one's a degree of four. Number of x-intercepts in each graph. Okay, so this one has for x-intercepts for f of x has two x-intercepts. G of x, whoops, g of x, I shouldn't say equals, I should say has. G of x has one, two, three x-intercepts, and h of x has one, two, three, four x-intercepts. Number of relative minimum and maximum points shown in each graph, I've already done that. f had one, g had two, h had three. What observations can we make from this information? Okay, as long as we don't have multiplicities of our factors, we also always have to keep that in mind, then we're going to cross the axis, okay? So if that is true, if none of our factors are the same, no multiplicity greater than one, then we can say that the degree, if we know the degree, the number of zeros is one less, so the number of x-intercepts is one less than the degree, and the number of mins and maxes is one less than the number of um, x-intercepts and two less than the degree, or one less than the degree, okay? So let's repeat that. Degree two, two x-intercepts, one max or min. Degree three, three x-intercepts, two max or mins. Degree four, four x-intercepts, three maxes and mins. So the number of x-intercepts is equal to the degree. The number of maxes and mins is always the number of, equal to the degree minus one. All right, so is this true for every polynomial? Consider the examples below. R equals x squared plus one. Degree of each polynomial. So this is, I'll just put D2, two, two, degree two, 
This polynomial has a degree of three, and this polynomial has one, two, three, four factors, so that's a degree four. Okay, number of x-intercepts in each graph, um, x int zero, x intercept one, x intercept two. Number of relative max and mins shown in each graph. Okay, I'll do that in red. This one, one min. This one, zero maxes or mins. And this one, one min. What observations can we make from this information? Well, this one here does not have any real roots because x squared plus one cannot equal zero or it can equal zero, but if it does, then x squared equals negative one and the square root of or square root of x would equal the square root of negative one or x would equal the square root of negative one, which is irrational or imaginary. Okay, it's not a real root. It didn't cross the x-axis. In this one here, same thing. If I took x squared plus two and set it equal to zero, it would be x squared equals negative two. I take the square root of both sides and I get x equal to the square root of negative two. Well, that's imaginary as well. So that's what's happening here. And this one here is forcing it to cross at x equals one. But there's something going on in this region here because of that. And what happened here? Multiplicity of three. A multiplicity of anything more than one is not going to give you a, um, that it's going to reduce the number of maxes and mins because of what it does to the function. Okay, there's a lot to be said about that, so I brought in the wording of it. The observations made in the previous examples do not hold for these examples, so it is difficult to determine from the degree of the polynomial function the number of relative maximum and, max and minimum points in the graph of the function. What we can say is that for a degree n polynomial function, there are at most n minus one relative maxima and minima. So we can say at most, but we can't say exactly how many. You can also think about the information you can get from a graph. If a graph of a polynomial function has n relative maximum and minimum points, you can say that the degree of the polynomial is at least that n plus one. Okay. All right, page six, six, eight. Page eight brings us to the relevant vocabulary for this lesson, I am going to leave that to you. I'm not going to read all this to you. Review this relevant vocabulary. Okay, page nine brings us to the end of lesson 14. Review the lesson summary and go to your problem set.